And people were asking, why were you in California? Uh, the simple answer is my family lives in California. My parents are there. My older brother, little sister, little brother are all there. And so every time someone asks me about once a year, I take a you know, break and I go and I preach somewhere else. And during that guest speaking times, if you look at my calendar, usually it will be in California where uh, I will ask for God to give me a chance to preach there. And uh, this time I went to speak at a uh, retreat for people in their 20s. So if you look around, uh, we do have people in their 20s, um, but we don't have a lot of them. And a lot of them, they, uh, they feel like they're kind of like putting up with the service where they don't feel like it's their culture. But it made me, um, it was good to be in a place where uh, the oldest person that was not a pastor was 31. And he introduced himself to me as like, hey, I'm the old guy of this bunch at 31 years old. I wonder how that made me feel, right? Walking into that room made me very aware of my graying hair, my bulgy body, and my 90s culture. I was self-conscious, and so when I was in that room, I was tempted to withdraw a little bit. But I was there to speak, so I prayed and I asked God to help me to be courageous because I believed that God had called me to that room, not just so that I could like, see my family afterwards, but because I felt as I was praying that God wanted me to share a message with that group. And I'm happy to report that people responded to the gospel with joy and a fresh wind in the Holy Spirit, uh, inspired us as we prayed together. And after a message in which I did some rap, the youngest guy at the camp, the 23-year-old, asked me if I preferred the musical stylings of Tupac or Biggie. And I was like, oh, we talked a little bit about Biggie. He's easier to relax to, but Tupac, more inspirational and prophetic. And as we were talking, I found myself smiling. As the Holy Spirit connected us in worship on the basis of the most important stuff, we discovered many other things that united us despite the cultural divide. When I first walked into that room, it just looked like a crowd of 20-somethings who all looked like the same age since they were all wearing casual retreat clothes. But after a day of being with them, it was like my eyes were adjusting to low-light conditions, and I could see difference in posture and mannerism and honestly a little bit of the skin quality of those who are younger 20s versus older 20s. Um, as they told me about their responsibilities and burdens and hopes, I could see that the 28-year-old, the 25-year-old, the 22-year-old, they were caring and measuring different things striving for different goals. And I realized that saying, oh, you're all so young, is similar to a European saying, all you Asians look the same. The inability to see each person's individual features, it comes from the belief that the entire group is other. When your heart is not open, your eyes will not perceive the details, and you will have trouble connecting names of faces, and seeing the unique qualities of each person. But the opposite, I found, is also true. Once I experienced the Spirit of God making us one on the basis of worship, I was able to see each person as they were. At first, a crowd of, for example, if you're with elementary school students, at first, a crowd of elementary school students, it's all like outstretched arms and open mouths as they're all yelling stuff at you. But if you begin to connect with them as fellow worshipers, they begin to ask profound questions. And you demonstrate uh, that they're so quick-witted, they're learning so fast, and they demonstrate such deep loyalty. Eventually, you begin to hear prayer requests from them that melt your heart, and you understand why God gives each of them individual attention. If you decide to go to the teenagers, you realize that just like you, they're learning how to accept the love of God and follow the example of Jesus. And once you believe that everyone in youth group is a person that needs the gospel just like you, you can see them not just as a crowd of teenagers, but as individuals, each with something to share with you. If you stick around for a few years, you see them evolve, and you see them take on new challenges and explore new interests. What I mean is at first, everyone seems so different. They're all so young, we say, so different from us. But if we open our hearts based on our common ground in worship, we are able to see what makes them all unique. We're also reminded of our moments of our past as we spend time with them. If we assume that they'll dismiss us as old people, we will preemptively dismiss them for being young. 
But if the Holy Spirit breaks down the walls between us, then we begin to feel the love of God and concern for each person. Our eyes adjust, and we're able to see each other as the member of the same family. I share this long-windedly with you because we have to stop making excuses for our disunity. Um, at our church, we sometimes think, okay, there's some people that I connect to, and there's a lot of other people that are just in the other category. And when a church is plagued with this type of division, it's not that we're out to get each other. We're not trying to hurt anyone. It's just that when we think of others as other, we stop noticing their needs. We forget that we're supposed to care about them. So as we look into today's passage, let's prepare our hearts with prayer, asking that the God who healed divisions in the passage will show up in our midst and heal the divisions in our church. Would you pray with me? God, in the same way that we sometimes, when we confront a group as a newcomer, we're afraid to really see them. I know that many times when we're walking through the hallways of our church, we think, oh, they're too Korean, oh, they're too young, they're too old. And we classify people as people that we will not open our hearts to. And as a result, we begin to neglect to pray for each other and neglect serving one another. And these divisions, they have real consequences because when there is neglect, there is pain and people are unable to reach their potential. God, help us to see that we are guilty of neglecting others, perhaps the children, the teenagers. We say that they're different and we don't give to them the care and mentoring that they need. Help us also to consider perhaps we are suffering from neglect, that as others call us the English-speaking community, and as they don't open their hearts to us, there is a loss that we feel. Would you help us to be honest about our hurts, that we might welcome in your healing? Now may the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts, be made holy and pleasing, for we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. God's word for us um, is from Acts chapter 6. Verses 1 through 7. But as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve called a meeting of all the believers. They said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God not running a food program. And so, brothers, select seven men who are well-respected and are full of the spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. Everyone liked this idea, and they chose the following. Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas of Antioch, an earlier convert from the Jewish faith to the Jewish faith. These seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them and laid their hands on them. So God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem and many of the Jewish priests were converted too. This is the word of the Lord. The passage presents a problem and then it describes a solution. Verse one presents the problem as follows. As the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So in the early church, there were two groups of Christians. One group mostly spoke Greek, and another group mostly spoke Hebrew. And when there is a language difference, there is also a cultural difference. Those who spoke Koine Greek, everyone around the Mediterranean region, uh, when that area was conquered by Alexander the Great, everyone began to be influenced by Greek culture and spoke uh, Koine Greek as the kind of universal language among all of those cities. The Jews who spoke Koine Greek were people who grew up as immigrants, who went to the cities around that region. These were Jews who had traveled, they were building businesses, they were seeking citizenship, and raising families in a foreign environment. On the other hand, the Hebrew-speaking Jews, they lived like their ancestors. They were farming, raising flocks, fishing, 
specializing in trades like carpentry. As a conquered people under heavy taxation, it was hard to make a profit, but they still worked the old ancestral lands and kept their traditions. They associated being true to their culture as a way of being true to God. Their experiences were different, but the Hebrew and the Greek-speaking Jews were united by worship. When they could, the Greek-speaking Jews would travel back to the temple in Jerusalem for the high holy days, where they worshipped alongside the Hebrew-speaking Jews, probably using bilingual friends as translators. So before that Passover, many Greek-speaking Jews were in town for the holiday. And the day after the Passover... You know that on Good Friday, Jesus was crucified. And then that weekend, Jesus rose from the dead. So the whole country is buzzing with people trying to separate the rumors from the news about what Jesus did. And then 50 days after Easter, the Holy Spirit was poured out from heaven and miracles began to happen. And thousands, both Hebrew-speaking and Greek-speaking Jews, began to believe that Jesus was the Messiah the crucified and resurrected Son of God. When that happened, at first it was like the entire church was on a very long retreat. People worshiping all day and praying and learning about Jesus and being filled with the Holy Spirit. And to fund these meetings so that people can eat at that retreat, some believers, it says, sold their possessions and their property and they brought that money to the apostles. And that's how they lived for a while. Everyone, they stopped working, and they just focused on worship. And to fund their lives, a couple people would sell their possessions and their property, and that money was distributed so that everyone could eat. And then after some weeks, people started to go back to work, and they established a rhythm of work and corporate worship so that instead of feeding everyone at church, the church focused on offering charity only to vulnerable people, like widows. So people still brought gifts, and from that money, the needs of the vulnerable were met, which is a beautiful thing. However, the first big problem in the early church was that only the Hebrew-speaking widows were being fed. The Greek-speaking widows were being neglected. Why did this happen? At first, I thought that it might be that the Hebrew believers were donating And they were saying, could you just use this on our widows, our mothers, and their vulnerable friends? That would kind of make sense. It'd be like if a Korean member donated money for scholarships just for Korean Americans, and then some non-Koreans, they complain, hey, how come our kids can apply for these scholarships when we're members of the church too? I thought maybe if one group was financially committed, the less committed group might be asking for equal treatment. And I thought that was this tension within this early church. But that was wrong. That was actually not what was going on. Acts chapter 4, verses 36 through 37 tells us this. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which is a Greek word meaning the son of encouragement, he sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. This guy is one of the Greek-speaking believers. And he's the one that is bringing a large sum of money. So what is happening, what is surprising, is that people in the Greek-speaking side of the culture were donating lots of money, and those widows were the ones being neglected. That would be like if some non-Koreans within our group donated scholarship money for needy members of the church, and they were told that only Korean-American members would be helped and all other members would be neglected. How does something like that happen? That is like a crisis of donor management. And that actually was encouraging to me. The fact that something so insulting to the people who gave the money happened meant that the priority of the church wasn't on maintaining good relationships with people who gave a lot of money. The apostles were not prioritizing that. What was happening was that the apostles were receiving the donations, and all of the apostles were, what was their heart language? They were all Hebrew-speaking. They all grew up around the um, towns in the northern part of uh, Galilee, and they were all Hebrew-speaking Jews. And the people that they initially tasked with buying, cooking, and distributing the food, they were all probably Hebrew-speaking Jews too. 
It's not that they hated the Greek-speaking widows. It's not that they wanted to neglect them, but no one took the initiative to ask the Greek-speaking believers for a list of the widows that they knew. Because they were out of sight, it was out of mind, and they were neglected when it came time for resources to be divided. And honestly, this happens at our church. The elders and pastors don't spend much time. Our our church is so big, and they don't spend much time on the English-speaking wing of this gigantic church, so they don't know when we have problems. If we don't complain, we don't get the janitorial services that the rest of the church takes for granted because they don't see the litter on the ground. If we don't complain when our heating system fails, as it did several times in the winter, it's easy for them to assume, oh, it's probably user error. Pastor Sam just doesn't know how to use the thermostat, instead of recognizing that something is wrong with the equipment. Like the Greek-speaking believers, the English-speaking believers of our church, we are growing in size, we're growing in financial commitment, so shouldn't we be given more money to spend on English ministry since the English-speaking members are giving more? I actually don't think so. What a person gives in worship is not a membership fee for services received. It is a free response to the grace of God. Amen? So our giving is to God, no strings attached. Amen? At church, people should speak up, not on the basis of entitlement because I gave so much. They speak up on the basis of need. If they see that people who need more are being neglected. So like the Greek-speaking believers asked for the widows to get what they needed, we are supposed to ask. And we asked and we got upgraded worship equipment. We asked and we got more janitorial services. And we are replacing our heating system by the fall. So in the winter, our praise team will not have to huddle in the cold trying to survive. We plan to also improve the room where our parents and babies worship. We see you, not literally, but we see you there. We want to find ways to fit more people into our fellowship hall. But honestly, some of the things that we want are really expensive. We want a sink in the fellowship hall, but that requires putting in a new sewage line. Fixing the leaks of this place requires completely replacing the roof. And I'm grateful for what we have. And on some things, I don't ask because it's not necessary given the cost. I'm the type of person that typically says, ah, it's okay. Almost always, it's okay, it's fine. But I am learning that part of loving is asking for more. Amen? On the first Sunday of April, our deacons went to visit other churches, and a lot of EM deacons went to visit a church where I had grown up, New Jersey Chodet Church. There, the English-speaking congregation is led by a pastor about my age, a guy named David. He's supported by Pastor Doug, who ministers to the older adults in the congregation, And the newly married pastor named Andre focuses on the younger adults, and Pastor Patrick serves the college students in that group. They also have directors who are coordinating missions. They have one for missions, one for music, one for creativity, one for tech. They also have pastoral interns. So it made me wonder, why is it that our English ministry has me and Pastor Ingwen, and at Chode, the English congregation has four full-time pastors, and four part-time directors in addition to many volunteers. You might be thinking, it's because they're bigger, right? And they are bigger, but they're not like that much bigger. When people ask me, this is, but this is why I think there's this difference. When people ask me, Pastor Sam, how are things going over at English ministry? I generally respond, we're doing great. We're doing great. We're fine. Because I want others to think that I'm doing a good job. Can you see how this would happen? How are things going with EM? Person who's in charge of EM, oh, things are going great at EM because I'm doing a good job. That's what I instinctively want to say. Because I tell them we're fine, the other decision makers of the church assume we don't need anything. But how did Pastor David convince his church to hire so many staff for his ministry? When they asked him, Pastor David, how are things going over at EM? He must have said, I need help. I need so much help. I see so many people that are just drifting in and out. Someone has to be trained to reach them. I see hurting people who are needing counseling, but they run away right after service because no one's chasing them down. I see bored people who need someone to show them how to serve and be excited for God's service. 
So I see Pastor David's team, and I realize that it's because the cry of his heart is, God, give these people more care, more care than what I can give. What is the cry of my heart? God, help me to be competent. Help them to approve of me. Help, them, help everyone to think that everything is going okay, that everything is fine. I realize that the cry of my heart is more loving of my reputation than it is loving of my congregation. And that is the primary reason why Pastor David's congregation has adequate and perhaps um, abundant resources so that people can be well discipled. Whereas here, I see people suffering. I see people kind of looking around, giving the church like an extra five minutes to reach out to them, but no one reaches out to them, and then they kind of sadly go home. I see that happen week after week. I should be telling people I meet, things are not okay. I want English ministry members to be coached, cajoled, counseled, confronted, whatever it takes so that they can learn to be more like Jesus. Because I don't see growth. I don't see a trajectory of growth in most of the people who come. I want you to have more quality time with more pastors. We can begin by increasing your access to our Christian education pastor, Pastor Sein Kwan. So I got him to come and lead prayer so that we can know how to pray for youth group and children's ministry and things. Please be here. Because if I say, we need more from other pastors in this church or EM, and then if they come and we don't, we're not here, that'll, that'll make it harder for me to advocate for more. I want Pastor uh, Jae Gwang Ke, who's our senior pastor, to be more present, to be preaching more, and to be serving more within our midst. I want to find ways for you to benefit from the other pastors of our church. But I also believe that we have needs that no other current pastor of Adam Down Church, many who are more busy than me, that they can offer to us. On Easter Sunday, it was a good Sunday. God brought about 250 people to English ministry service. But after having organized the Good Friday activity and then having led that service, I spent Saturday working on my sermon, and I was tired Easter Sunday morning because I hadn't slept that much the night before. And I didn't coach and encourage our volunteers, many who were preparing special things, but despite my lack of pouring into them, they all did a great job. There was the special body worship presentation, special food being served, and an organized effort to welcome newcomers to our church. I am tempted to say Easter was fine. But by what standard? What would we have been able to offer to our visitors if we had as many pastors and staff doing English ministry as they're currently doing Korean ministry? Compared to the counseling, coaching, community groups, and classes that we could be offering, I realize that we are neglecting the people that God is bringing to our church. I'm like a single parent with a disability who is trying to offer my best for my family instead of asking for help. The fact that I'm trying, it doesn't change that fact that I am contributing to the neglect of my family if I am constantly telling people we're fine. We're fine. We're not fine because potential disciples are just attending. We're not fine because visitors are going home unloved, unchallenged. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. We are wasting opportunities and neglecting our potential. So I, believe, I have to say this out loud. I believe we're being neglected. But the passage tells me to not assume that it's due to malice. There is no conspiracy to try to keep the EM small. People are just hanging out with the people that they always hang out with. And since none of the people making staffing decisions are worshiping weekly with the, week, uh, with the English ministry, then they will not know that there is a problem unless we voice it. Our problem is essentially the same one facing the early church in verse 1. Because all of the decision makers are members of the Hebrew-speaking group, the needs in the Greek-speaking community were neglected. Verse 1 presents the problem. I've only covered verse 1 so far. Each verse that follows offers a part of the solution. In verse 2, we see that making the problem public is the first step to solving it. 
Instead of getting embarrassed at this report and promising to do better and then burying the problem, it says in verse 2, so the 12 called a meeting of all the believers. We screwed up. We need everyone together. Everyone was asked to attend, and implicit in verse 2 is that the apostles explained the situation, probably saying something like, hey, people brought money to us. A lot of, them, a lot of the money was brought by Greek-speaking believers. And we tried to organize the volunteers and prepare and distribute the food fairly, but we had blind spots. And none of the Greek-speaking widows were fed, and this is not acceptable. But we're not capable of doing a better job. That's why they continue in verse 2. They said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the Word of God, not running a food program. Their point is, us, the Hebrew-speaking leaders, us trying harder is not going to solve the problem. We need to keep doing what God told us to do. We're the ones that know Jesus best, and we need to keep teaching about Jesus. And so after making the problem public in verse 2 and verse 3, they ask all the believers to choose some new leaders who will be able to handle this responsibility. And so, brothers, select seven men who are well-respected and are full of spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. So the qualification is that they have to be full of the Holy Spirit. They have to be wise. Why do they need such leaders of exceptional quality? It's because these leaders will ultimately exercise great authority. These deacons will need authority to choose vendors, spend money, and assign work to other volunteers. Because if you have great leaders, but you don't give them the authority that they need to do their jobs, they will either quit or become passive. To get exceptional output from your team members, you need to give them the authority for them to fulfill their responsibilities. And it is scary when you give authority away. Remember, at that time, they didn't have a building. A large portion of the expenditures of the church was this food program. So a bunch of money was brought to the leaders. What were they doing? They were saying, well, we need someone to run this food program they pretty much took most of that money and said, hey, run it. And they gave that financial authority to somebody else. When you do something like that, when you give away authority, the temptation is to give it to someone that you handpick, that you trust, that you have a close relationship with. But notice that the 12 didn't choose who would do the work. They saw that their previously handpicked leaders had failed because they had the same blind spots as them. That's why they admit it. We don't know what's best in the situation. They ask the whole group to prayerfully choose the new leaders. The apostles who are about to give away significant portions of their authority, um, they did it because, verse 4 tells us, they had a holy ambition. Verse 4. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. If I wanted to spend more time watching Netflix or golfing, I'm going to have a hard time finding volunteers to do the things that I could do. But if my sincere ambition and my pure passion is to pray with people who are in crisis and to study the Word of God so that it's always fresh in my mouth and I can teach more effectively, then I believe God will move others to help. And so for the sake of their holy ambition, the apostles are asking for new people to step up and they're willing to make sure they get all the authority that they need to fulfill responsibilities. And because that happened, verse 5 tells us that we can expect success. Everyone liked this idea, and they chose the following. Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas of Antioch, an earlier convert to the Jewish faith. When the apostles communicated clearly about the need to the church, the church responded by choosing seven men with Greek first names. So instead of putting one token Greek-speaking believer into the leadership and calling it progress, the church was moved by the Holy Spirit to give seven of the new seven leadership positions to those who were marginalized. One man, Nicholas, was from Antioch, and he was a double outsider. Every other person that was chosen was ethnically a Jew that had grown up in these other cultures. But Nicholas was a Gentile. He was of a different ethnicity, and he had first become a Jew. And then from that place, 
of having converted to Judaism, he converted again to believing that Jesus was the Messiah. So Nicholas is someone that is not just culturally and linguistically different, he's ethnically different. This was a radical decision, but it was the right decision because it demonstrated that God's plans were to include all language groups. It showed that language, culture, or ethnicity would not prevent anyone from leading in the church. And finally, in verse 6, we see the last step of the solution. These seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them, and they laid their hands upon them. Laying hands and praying for someone, in this case, it does not mean that you're asking them to be filled with the Holy Spirit, because verse 3 tells us that they already had the Holy Spirit. And verse 5 tells us Stephen, in particular, was filled with the Holy Spirit and faith. This is important because sometimes laying on of hands in prayer symbolizes that this is the mature group and the people being prayed for are the immature group. So if you have people who are sick being prayed for, if you have people who are new to the faith and being prayed for to receive the Holy Spirit, you're symbolizing that these are the experts and these are the new people. But that's not the reason that the laying on of hands was happening in this situation. The Bible also has a tradition of laying hands and praying for someone who is already strong and mature to identify them as a leader that God has already chosen. So when Moses called Joshua and he laid hands and prayed for Joshua, Moses was not saying, oh, he's so young, he needs my prayer so that he can lead. He's saying, this is the person that God has chosen that God wants all of you to follow now. In the same way, when Samuel anointed David as king, Samuel was saying, God wants me to testify to you that this is the person you should follow. Thus, when the apostles laid hands to pray for the deacons, they were saying, we believe that God has called these people to lead in the church along with us. This week in Chicago, Pastor Hak Chie Lee was ordained. This means that a leader in the evangelical church in America stood over Pastor Lee not to give him something that he could only get through him. The other person was just testifying, this is a person that the church should follow because this is a person who is trained and ready to serve. The point is that when you lay hands to pray for someone, you are not asserting your dominance over them. The church is not a multi-level marketing scheme where one person works under another leader. We, the church, should be a three-level system. There is God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They have all the authority. Only God deserves our ultimate obedience. Our ambition must always be to serve God. Far below God, there is the level of mature believers. Remember that Jesus said about titles and leadership in Matthew chapter 23. He said, you are not to call anyone rabbi, for you have one teacher. You are all brothers. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for you have one father who is in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. What does that mean? How many of you call me Pastor Sam? Raise your hand. Does that mean you're sinning against Jesus who told you to don't call anyone rabbi? No. He was saying, when you call me Pastor Sam, don't think that I'm infallible. Don't think that you have to please me. Just know that that's what I do. I'm, I'm, I'm just P. Sam. I happen to have a job where I lead Bible studies and I rap in, you know, like Christianese or something like that. That's what I do, but that doesn't mean that I'm special. It doesn't mean that you have to please me. It doesn't mean that you have to tiptoe around my opinions. When Jesus says, don't call anyone father or rabbi or instructor, Jesus is saying, in my system, there is only God that is leading, that has all the authority. Everyone else, they're in mutual submission to each other if they understand the Bible. They use the Bible to challenge each other to be more biblical, to be more pleasing to the true authority. And then there is the new converts or people that are not sure yet, and they need to look up to people who know what the Bible says. That is the way God designed the church. If you know how to follow the example of Jesus, if you already obey God the Father, then we're on the same level, amen? Instead of trying to dominate each other with titles like the pagans, we are to mutually submit to one another. 
So the apostles would therefore never say to the deacons, do what I say because I outrank you. All Christian leaders point to Scripture and say, you know, in this case, maybe we can better please God by doing this. So the deacons who served the English ministry, they recently confronted me and said, Pastor Sam, we need more pastors than you in the English ministry. And my initial response, as I said, was, what do you mean? You have me. I'm totally enough. But through their patient input, I'm seeing that I contribute to the neglect of the English ministry by telling everyone that we're fine. So if anyone asks how EM is doing, I hope you'll join me in saying, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Can you say that with me? How is EM doing? The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. We are praying for God to send more workers to the English ministry. Amen? In conclusion, what happens when the problem is identified and the solution is implemented? The problem is one group was being neglected. The solution was to mobilize leaders to meet their needs. As a result, verse 7 tells us, so God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish priests were converted too. If we as a church have more pastors doing more in English ministry, then our members will be equipped to do more, then God's message will spread more and the number of believers at Adam Down will greatly increase. Amen? I want to end by wondering with you this last phrase. It says that many of the Jewish priests were converted too. How crazy is it that Jewish priests were being converted? These were people that if they became Christian, they would lose their public societal status and they would lose their income. It was their job to be a priest for the Jews. What would move them so much that they became Christians right after the choosing of these seven deacons. Scripture doesn't say, this is just my guess. Those who work in a religious organization know that it is our human tendency to guard our position and authority. So the Jewish priests are very aware of how pagan power structures can infiltrate God's house. They know that you have to side with the powerful people in temple or you will lose status you will get neglected. But what did they see in the life of the early church? They see a minority group complaining that they're being neglected in a way that could potentially embarrass the current leadership. But the leaders carefully listen and offer a sensible solution, and this becomes implemented, and the organization quickly regains momentum. This sounds like the way every organization should run, but organizations generally don't run this way. Because leaders are trying to maximize their authority, simple problems don't end up getting solved. And that was the situation in the Jerusalem temple. But in the church, these Jewish priests see a system in which everyone is trying to do God's will. And therefore, the power of God gets released through honest conversations and pure prayers. I believe that there are many leaders in religious and nonprofit organizations all around us who are tired of their organization failing to address simple problems because people are afraid to share authority and people are not willing to be in mutual submission. But if we at Adam Down talk about our problems and implement solutions in biblical ways, I believe that many will be drawn to worship with us. May it be. Let us pray together. God, would you help us to recognize that you are doing something here and it demands a response. Would you help us to recognize that you are gathering people, you are awakening hearts, you are causing faith to stir in our midst. God, would you help us to see that this means that more work needs to be done. Mentors need to be ready. More community leaders need to be ready. We need more resources to give so that people who are awakened to interest for a moment right after worship, that their hearts are not left alone, but they are ushered and guided into the next thing that is helpful for their growth. God, would you help us to see that opportunities that you create are being wasted? Would you help us to mourn that we're not able to convert on the opportunities you're creating? because we have allowed ourselves to be in a situation where the needs of the English-speaking members 
are being neglected. God, we thank you for what you're already doing. We pray, O oh God, that you would forgive us if our fears about what you want us to be in Adam Down English ministry, if our fears about taking on greater responsibility, if our fears about needing change, if that's contributing to us neglecting the church by not asking for changes, pray, Lord, that you would forgive us. Pray, Lord, that you would unite us around the same message, that we want you to do more, and therefore we want you to send more workers into these harvest fields. God, would it be that in this year and in the years to come, we would be able to see the problem being raised, the solution being implemented, and many, many people being blessed. All this for your sake, for your will to be done. These things we pray in Christ's name.